All right. Well, it is it is really good to be with you here this evening. I it's, it, I know it's kind of a sort of a last minute thing. Pastor didn't even know we were going to be coming till uh, Monday or Tuesday. I think I got in contact with him, and uh, and I, I'm incredibly grateful that he allowed us to be able to present our ministry and and be able to preach for you tonight. Uh, just you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe you might be bummed about not seeing the video, but me, I don't know if I like seeing myself up there. And I had a mustache, not a goatee now. So I'm just like, ah. So I'm glad you guys get to watch it at a later date. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But before I do, uh, I talked to uh, Don and Jerry Judd on, I think it was Thursday, Thursday night. And uh, he, he's, he said, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that probably uh, have stories about me from when I was growing up. He's, he's like, uh, if anybody tries to tell you any stories, you make sure you write their names down so I know who they are. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I said, I said, if I do that, they're probably going to tell somebody else's name to get somebody else in trouble. But anyways, so you, but you feel free to tell me any stories that you want about them. Uh, but anyways, just kind of give you a understanding of how every how that everything is. I I grew up in New Zealand as a missionary kid. Well, kind of part in America and then and then in New Zealand. I came to New Zealand when I was 13 years old, and my sister was 10, and we came came there to New Zealand for the first time. And my uh, parents were were watching over another past another missionary's work in a place called Pataperu Umu on the Kapiti Coast. And then after we were there for about a a year and a half, then uh, which which is a requirement of your visa for a missionary to get into New Zealand, they have to be sponsored in by another church, and they have to serve there for a year and a half. Now the government's changed that to it has to be three years now, so it's a, it's a bit longer. You have to stay in one spot for three years serving with somebody before you can actually go out and and go out on your own and, and start plant plant a church. Uh, but the Sorry, I just lost my thoughts there for a second. But uh, we, we were there in New Zealand, and uh, when I was about, I don't know, 19, maybe 20, I went back to Southern California. I went to Southern California. My father flew with me, dropped me off at, at West Coast Baptist College, said, see you later, and went back to New Zealand. And I didn't know anybody, and if you've... If you ever go to New Zealand, you'll you'll notice that the roads are the roads are small, the vehicles are all small, everything's you know smaller in size, and then you land in L.A. where everything's huge and big, and everybody's honking and yelling and screaming at each other. It was a huge culture shock for me, just kind of getting dropped off there, and uh, went did Bible college. That's where I met my wife, who's from Florida originally, and then after we graduated Bible college, we we had gotten married and served. At a, at a church just for like three or four months, waiting for my wife's, uh, well, it was probably more like seven months, I'm not sure. She, you can ask her, she's better at time. And uh, we, got, we stayed there long enough to get my wife's visa, and, we, and then we moved to New Zealand, and we've been serving there with my, with my father. Originally, we didn't, we didn't feel God was calling us to, to New Zealand. We actually thought God was calling us to the country of Vanuatu. And if you don't know where if you don't know where New Zealand is, there's there's a small island off the coast of New Zealand called Australia. That kind of gives you a perspective where we're at. And then same same sort of side off that that east coast of Australia, above New Zealand, there's a place called there's the islands of Vanuatu. We we thought God was calling us there. And so the idea was we, we would go back to New Zealand. We'd gain some experience serving with, with, with my parents there, serving in a church. And then af- and, and while doing that, also getting my wife her permanent residency. So that when we were in Vanuatu, if we had any medical needs or anything like that, we could just fly back to New Zealand, which is just a couple hours, instead of flying all the way back to America and, and ha- take care of any medical needs. But it was during that time... In, uh, in New Zealand, when we got to that point where we got my wife her visa, we were ready to, to go. We started to start the process of heading, going towards Vanuatu, and God just kind of was like, nope. And, okay, and we 
prayed about it, and okay, maybe God wants us to do this. So we, we, we started to head to Vanuatu a different way, and, and God would close that door, and then we'd try it a different way, and God would close that door. And, and we kind of said, okay, God, what are you doing? And, and after much prayer, it seemed like God was just saying, just wait, just wait. So we, we ended up working with my parents for another few years. I ended up getting ordained as a pastor, and then I became the assistant pastor of Harvest Baptist Church, serving there and also working uh, a secondary job as a, a tree, in a tree nursery. And, uh, and it was in 2018, my parents went back on furlough for eight months. And so it was during that time that I became, now I'm the lead pastor uh, while my parents are away, or my father was away, and now I'm kind of running everything. And we, we gained a lot of experience during that time. And, and, it was, and actually, during those eight months, it seemed like Satan threw everything he could at us, uh, even things where we're like, what do we do? How do we handle this? And I would call my father up, and he would, he, he, when I called him up on that particular subject, he's like, wow, in 15 years of being a pastor, I've never come across something like this. And he's like, well, let's just dive in God's word and figure out what we're supposed to do. And so we did, and God helped us do that, and it was a great learning time. But it was during, the, during that time, uh, if, if I just rewind just, a, just for a moment, uh, when I was on deputation the very first time at 12, 11, 12 years old with my parents, I learned a great skill of falling asleep in the car, which made deputation incredibly fast. Those traveling uh, to different places, I would, in the car, out in a minute, and I'd sleep the whole time. And I took that same, I guess, skill with me to New Zealand. And so when I was in my teen years, I never actually saw much of New Zealand except for destinations because I was always sleeping. And now I'm, you know, I, my parents are, are gone. We're running everything. And now I'm taking people to teen camps and family camps. And I can't sleep because people's lives depend on me staying awake. And so I, I'm driving. And as I'm driving through New Zealand, I'm, I'm coming across town after town after town where as we'd go through it, there'd be like 500 people here, a couple thousand people here. And as I'm looking, I'm just like, wow, there was no church there. There's no church in this one. There's just a little small 10-person Anglican church here. And as I'm starting to see New Zealand, to me, for the first time, even though I had lived there for so long, it, God, God brought the verses, Romans 10 to 14, to my mind, which says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And... It was in that moment when God really started placing the burden on my heart and eventually my wife's heart for the people of New Zealand. And so when, when, and so several years ago, my wife and I actually helped my father plant a church in Masterton, which is about an hour and ten minutes over the mountain range southeast of Palmerston North, and, and this was before we felt called to be in New Zealand. And so what was happening is we helped my father plant a church, and we, we, would, we would run the services for that week, and they would run the services in Palmerston North, and then the next week we'd swap, and we'd be in Palmerston North, and they'd be in Masterton. And we did that for three years until, until the Judds came, and they, they now are, are running that. They took over that, the work there, and we... Uh, when we finish deputation, we are going to be heading back to work alongside the Judds uh, there in Masterton. And then, uh, Lord willing, after several years and getting it to grow, and uh, Lord willing, we can, br we can train somebody up to become the pastor, then uh, maybe looking at going up to Gisborne, which is north of that. There's a huge area, Gisborne, and also the town of Gisborne, the city of Gisborne, where there's over 100,000, maybe 200,000 people there, and there's not one good gospel-preaching church there, um, just Roman Catholic churches, Anglican churches. And you'll, when, when you guys see the video, you'll see that uh, over 52% of all Kiwis, all people in New Zealand, claim, uh, they claim atheism. They don't want anything to do with God. They don't want anything to do with religion, nothing. And when you talk, talk to a lot of the younger generation, they actually 
say, oh, religion, that's, that's, the old, that's for the elder generation, the older generation. We, that's, that's not for me. And, and so you'll find this. There's a, even though New Zealand is a beautiful country, I mean, gorgeous country, people come from all over the world to, to hike, to camp, to fish in New Zealand, to hunt in New Zealand. I mean, we've got eight different types of deer in New Zealand. There's no hunting seasons. You just hunt whenever you want. And so people come from all over the world to do these activities and, and to do thrill-seeking things like zorbing, which is you get inside this huge plastic ball and they just push you down to hell, and you're like, ah. and, 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 and then jumping out of an airplane. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but jump out of an airplane, bungee jumping, and they take it to the extreme. I mean, everything's to the extreme. So when they bungee jump, they don't just bungee jump off of a bridge and, ah, you know. I mean, they, no, they take it a lot farther. You, you jump off and go half of your body into the river, come back up. You know, they take everything to the extreme because they're, they're, there's this darkness, a, a need there. Uh, and one of the things that's a huge problem in New Zealand is we actually, because New Zealand's a socialized, socialized medicine, social, socialist country, uh, a lot of your taxes, about 40-some percent of your taxes, go straight to the government to pay for all the different, um, quote-unquote, free medicine and, and all this. And one of the things that we have is at 15 years old in New Zealand, you're, allowed, you're legally allowed to go out on your own you're allowed to leave school, leave your family, go out on your own, and the government will give you a free a, a flat, a free apartment to stay in. They'll give you free money every week, and they say, hey, live on that until you, you get a job. Well, what 15-year-old, what, what person in their right mind is going to go get a job if you've got a free place to stay and free money coming every week? And so I personally know people that, are, that were like 35 years old before they got their first job. And so we've got this happening, and... And there's a lot of a lot of just people getting into everything over there: drugs, alcohol, sex, and there's a it, it's it's just kind of just breaking the, the the country apart. We have a lot of broken homes, broken families, uh, people growing up and not knowing who their who their father was, and and then what happens is New Zealand once they hit their teenage years and they go out on their own, they they, they don't feel loved. They feel like there's no hope. There's no point to life. They, they, they're, they're, they're bored because they got nothing to do, and so they get into everything. And when that, and, and when the Bible says that sin is pleasant for a season, and once that season's over, they, they end up committing suicide. And so we have New Zealand has the highest teenage suicide rate per capita in the, in the entire world, just there in New Zealand. And we have, we have uh, five or six million people there in New Zealand. And although it's small, and, and I need to clarify, when you guys eventually do see the video, it says that New Zealand can fit inside the state of Colorado. That's like the land mass could fit in there. But the way God's made it is that uh, it, it actually spans the bottom of the South Island to the top of the North Island, goes from about Key West, Florida, all the way up to Pennsylvania. So it's very long, um, but, but narrow. And uh, so that, that's kind of a give you a little bit of an understanding of what we are going to be doing, what New Zealand's like. There's a lot more I could be telling you, a lot more that's been going on, especially recently uh, with the country, uh, bills that are being passed. I was just talking to, to the Judds, uh, and they were telling me that they're trying to, the government's trying to, that they've got a law in right now that they're trying to pass that will, that's cracking down uh, for pastors and, and people like that on talking about homosexuality and, and various things. And, and if, they, if you are caught talking about what they consider hate speech or discriminatory speech and things like that, that you will get thrown in jail for it. And so these, these are just one of many things that are, that are starting to happen in New Zealand, especially since COVID. They're just kind of cracking down on, on things and being quite restrictive. And so uh, definitely pray for New Zealand. One thing that if you could pray for us and pray for you know, other missionaries that are trying to get to back to their field is f for us going to New Zealand because New Zealand is so strict uh, with COVID. There's a lot of requirements, but one of the things is the 14-day the uh, quarantine. But we're, we're praying that we fall into a loophole, a exemption, uh, which the exemption would be that they... We left right before COVID, and then COVID's had, COVID has hit, and we're praying that they will look at it as we got caught outside of 
New Zealand and that we're trying to come back home, which is what we're doing. We're coming back. Uh, we're praying that they'll look at it that way because if they don't look at it that way, then we will have to pay the quarantine fees. And the quarantine fees right now is $5,500 for myself, $3,200 for my wife, and then $1,000 per child that we have to pay for the quarantine fees. They put you up in these special fenced off hotels that they have there. So if you could just pray that we f are exempt from that, because that's a hefty price to, to pay. Um, one thing that's going to be uh, tough <laughs> to do. But um, there's, there's a lot more I wish I could say. But for sake of time, if you could turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm probably going to have to go full Kiwi on you and just start speaking really fast now. I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just do what the Lord leads here. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to be verse 37. And if you are willing and able to do so, if you could please stand for the reading of God's word. Hebrews chapter 11, begin in verse 37. It says, They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Verse 1 of chapter 12 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with, the pa with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint, in your minds. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in your house. I thank you for the freedoms that we have, that we can open your word, that we can be here in, in, in a church and not worry about the police coming in and, and taking us off to, to prison. I pray that as we, as we meet here tonight, that we will not take that for granted, but that we will hear uh, your words preached and that we will not just be hearers of your words only, but that we will be doers as well, that we will take what we hear tonight, apply it to our lives, so that our lives can be more honoring and glorifying to you. Please be with everything that is said and done. May it be honoring to you as well. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, probably... Uh, Four years ago, I think it was four or five years ago now, uh, we had a restaurant, an American restaurant that came to New Zealand for the very first time, and we, we were very excited, and every time we went up north for teen camps or family camps, we could not wait to go to this restaurant and get some food from, from this place. And this, this restaurant, American restaurant, is called Dunkin' Donuts. And we love to make sure we went over there. And, if you, and in New Zealand, our donuts are a bit different. Uh, there are several different types, but one of the more common donut is like, kind of looks like a, a hot dog bun, an American hot dog bun, with your cream down the center and a cherry on top. That's a, that's a, a kiwi donut. And, and so when you, when you brought the American donut with the hole in the center, that was just revolutionary. And uh, so we, we went up there, and so what I want you to do, hopefully you've had dinner. If you haven't, I'm very sorry, but I want you to imagine with me tonight that you are in the drive-thru at Dunkin' Donuts. And you, I want you to think of your favorite donut. I want you to think of your favorite drink, whether it's cold or hot, whatever it may be, and you, 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 you place your order. And you, you pull up to the window, you pay the person at the counter, and you're waiting. And you can't wait for that nice, hot just moist donut with maybe the frosting melting off the top. You can't wait to bite into that donut. And, and you see the person coming. They're bringing you bringing your food, and they open up the window, and they hand you a banana and a glass of milk. And you look at them with a puzzled look. And you're like, um, <laughs> excuse me, uh, this, is, this is not what I ordered. I ordered this donut with the frosting and the sprinkles on top and maybe hot chocolate or coffee. I, that's what I ordered. And they go, we know. But here at Dunkin' Donuts, we care 
about your health. And this is the healthiest choice for you. And you might get mad. You go, no, 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 no. I did not come to Dunkin' Donuts for health advice. I came to Dunkin' Donuts to fill my sweet tooth. I paid you, and I expect to get the donut and the drink that I, that I wanted. You don't go and bring a painter to your house and go through the painstaking process of, of picking out all the colors and what's going to go here and there and then go, ho- go away on vacation and come back and find rainbows and unicorns all over your house. You wouldn't want that. You'd be mad. You'd be demanding a refund, demanding them to come back and fix it. And we as people around the world, we, we expect, when we pay for something, we expect results. As a, an employee, when you hire somebody, you don't pay them to do your job, to do their job, and then come around the corner and find them taking a nap or, or, reading, or you know, reading a text or being on their phone or whatever. You expect results, and rightly so. But if we are not careful as Christians, we can take that same mentality of results and place that upon God. And that, if we're not careful, can, can prevent us from serving God in a proper way. Me, as myself, as a, as a missionary, I know that I have to be very careful because serving in places like New Zealand and, and England and Australia, and et cetera, those places, even though they were, they were built on a biblical foundation, similar to here in America, they, you could be there. I, I know missionaries that have been there for 40 years and after 40 years of, of going out and, and compelling people to come in and, and, and witnessing to people and, and doing everything they can to see people saved and at, baptized and added to the church and discipled and doing everything they can, even after 40 years, they've got maybe 50, 60 people. And then you look at a missionary from, that's gone was to Haiti or the Philippines. And they go, they've been there for one year and they've seen 200 people saved in their first year. And as missionaries, we, we look and go, wow, am, what am I doing wrong? A- am I not where God wants me to be? Because we're basing everything upon results. And the same thing can happen for pastors. A pastor in one place can have a thousand people, and a pastor in another place can have 20 people. And they're both working just as hard. They're both doing what God's asked them to do. But is, either, is, is, is one more successful than the other? But I want, I want to to kind of say a thing tonight here that for you to think about. When it comes to God, success, success is not based upon results, but off of obedience. And if you live your Christian life, if you serve God based upon results, you are quickly going to fail. Because you might go out soul winning, and somebody over here sees somebody get saved every time. And you go out and you never see somebody saved. And before long, if you're basing it purely on results, you're going to quit. You're going to leave. You're going to say, I'm done with this. And, and we have to be very, very careful when it comes to serving God. And the question that I want to ask you tonight that I want you to think about is, what is your priority? What are your priorities when it comes to obeying God? What's your priority? Tonight, we're going to look real quick tonight. Three reasons to live a faith-driven life rather than a results-driven life. A faith-driven life rather than a results-driven life. Too many people choose to obey God once he proves himself or once he gives a sign. And when we look here at the end of chapter 11, we see here, uh, if you even look at chapter 11 in itself, a a chapter that's all about faith. And as you go through this, and I encourage you to read it on your own time, you're going to see verses like, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, by faith, Joseph. And these men and women of God, they were used, used by God because of their faith, because they chose to step out by faith. And if Abraham was to come before you tonight and to present his ministry of where he was going, he would, he would stand up here and you would ask him, where are you going? And he'd be like, I don't know. How, how, long, are you going to, how long is it going to take you to get there? I don't know. Do you, how, how, long is it gonna, how long are you going to be there? I don't know. And every question you ask him would be, I don't know. Because he was just, by faith, following God. Wherever God lead, led him, he was going. And he was trusting God. He gave up everything he had. 
and he went and he followed God. And we see here, by faith, God used men and women in the Bible, and he had, they had given them a promise. And that promise was that one day the Messiah would come. One day they would receive the Messiah. And so we see here at the end here, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. These men and women, they gave their life for a promise that they had not yet seen come to pass. They hadn't seen the results of this promise, but they gave their life for it. How many of us would be willing to give our life for something we had not seen come to pass. We had not seen the results of it. They died for this promise. Would you be willing to give your life for something that you hadn't seen happen yet? Sometimes God asks us to obey Him, asks us to step out by faith and go, and we don't. Whatever it may be, it doesn't have to be a missionary, it doesn't have to be a pastor. Maybe God is simply asking you to step out by faith and start tithing. Maybe God is just asking you to step out by faith and join the choir. Or maybe help out with, with cleaning the church. Whatever it may be. And if we lived our life based upon results, the, the people that clean the church here, if, if they're not careful, they're going to they're gonna quickly go, you know, no one ever thanks me for cleaning those toilets. Never. No one's ever thanked me for that. No one's ever thanked me for, for the way I fold the toilet paper just right, you know, how they do in the hotels. No one ever thanks me for that. I quit. I'm done. And if nobody stepped out, if nobody said, okay, I'll, I'll pick up the banner, you're, you're done, I'll, I'll do it. If nobody took up that, that person's job of cleaning the toilets, very quickly people here at Fostoria Baptist Church would quickly realize that the toilets are not being cleaned. And then eventually people would stop Coming to church, they'd be more doing the, the live stream than coming here because have you seen the toilets? Nobody cleans them. And because they based it upon results. And is your priority in serving God, is it because you want to get something out of it or is it because you're going to serve God? You're going to clean the toilets, you're going to be in the choir, you're going to go out soul winning, you're going to start tithing. Maybe you're going to start teaching Sunday school class, whatever it may be. Maybe whatever God has been working in your heart, pricking at your heart, pulling at your heart, are you going to do that because it's God's asked you to? Or are you going to do it because I, I, I want to get something out of it? What is your priority? Because only one of those priorities is going to succeed. The second reason that we see tonight that we need to live a faith-driven life rather than a results-driven life is because God doesn't follow our plans but His. God does not follow our plans but His. And you'll, you'll realize that God doesn't always fulfill His plans precisely when we want Him to, and He doesn't fulfill His plans precisely the way we want Him to. I'll give you a real quick example of this. A, a, uh, there are people that I know that have prayed for a loved one to get saved prayed for them for decades, decades, praying for that loved one, that friend, whoever it may be, to get saved. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And if they, if they believed the lie that Satan was telling them that would come to them oftentimes, be like, does God really answer your prayers? Does God really hear your prayers? You, he hasn't, you haven't seen this person get saved, so maybe God doesn't. Maybe you should just stop. Maybe you should just quit. But they persevered. They kept praying. And one day, they died. They died. They did not see God answer their prayer. But what happens? The funeral happened. That loved one came. The pastor gets up. The people are there. The pastor gives a plan of salvation, gives the, presents the gospel. That, that person hears it, remembers the joy that that person had, remembers the, there was something different about them, the way they acted, the way they dressed. They always seemed happy. There was something about them. I wanted, and they want to know. And they hear the gospel presented, and they get saved. God answered that person's prayer, but not when they wanted it to, not how they wanted it to. But God still answered it. God still, um, God still allowed that person to receive Christ as their Savior. So we have to remember, God does not follow our plans, but His. And then finally, this is one that we're going to be on for just a few more minutes longer than the rest here. It's num number three. It helps us when we live a faith-driven life rather than a results-driven life. It helps us focus more on God. So when we are focused more on the aspect of obeying out of obedience rather than gain, it changes our perspective on life. I'm going to give you an example of this. 
my daughter, whose name will not be mentioned because she's here in this room, she, when she was a couple years old, I remember uh, she, was, she was doing some stuff, and there were some toys over there. And I said, can you go pick up those toys? And she had oftentimes been pretty good about it, and she, she went to go do it like I had asked her to do, but she stopped. And I was like, what's she doing? And she turns around, and she goes, will I get a cookie? And I went, what? Will you get a cookie? I didn't even say anything about a cookie. I didn't say, hey, if you go do that, I'll, I'll give you a cookie. I'll give you a treat. No, I didn't say that. I may have been thinking about it. I may have said, you know, I want to see how she does. If she does this, I'm going to bless her for it. If she has a good attitude, if she obeys. But I didn't say she'd get a cookie. But I told her to do it. And she goes, will I get a cookie? And the thing is, is we do that to God. God asks us to do something. And we go, will I get a cookie? What's in it for me? What do I get out of it? And when you learn to obey out of obedience, rather than obey for gain, it just it changes the way you think, the way you live your life. First Kings, if you could turn there real quick, First Kings chapter 17. We have to hurry. We're going to consider this like Bible drill time. First Kings chapter 17. In verse 8, 1 Kings 17, we're going to begin in verse 8 here. And this is talking about Elijah. And the word of the Lord came unto him unto Elijah, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and he said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And if you continue to read on, you see a great miracle happens. Uh, she, he says, Go make a cake for me first. And because she says, Hey, I'm going to go do this, but I was only going to make the last little bit that I have, just this little bit that I have. And my son and I, we were going to eat it, and then we were going to die, because that's all we have left. We have nothing else, because if you remember, there's a, there's a drought going on, and there was no, it hasn't been raining, and so nobody has any food, much food left. And so they're like, we're going to do this, and then we're going to die. And he says, go make for me first and then make for yourself. And if you do this, if you trust me, if you trust God, God's going to make sure that that barrel of food and that, that uh, barrel of, of oil, that cruise of oil is not going to run out until the, the, the drought is done. And we see God answers that. And she, she has food and oil for the rest of, of the time. And we see a great miracle happen because, uh, because Elijah chose to obey God. But where was he before this? Before this, Elijah had, had been sent bef before King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and he had been told to tell them to repent of worshiping their false gods, and they didn't do so, and they didn't believe him that, it was, that rain was not going to come until they did so, until he prayed and asked God to bring the rain. And so they set him on his way, but very quickly they realized, hey, it's not raining. We need to find this man. So they're hunting him down. They're wanting to kill him. And God has him hiding by the book Cherith. And everything is great. He served God. He obeyed God. And now he's got water abundant for him. He's got ravens bringing him food every day. Life was great. And then all of a sudden, because it's not raining, the brook dried up. The ravens stopped bringing him food. And he could have turned around and said, God, what are you doing? Do you, do you, are you mad at me? Do you hate me? Like, what, what is going on here? I did exactly what you asked me to do, and now you're taking everything from me. What's going on? And then we see here, God comes to him and he says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon. And a lot of scholars did some studies on this, and they believe that this is actually the hometown of Queen Jezebel. The very queen... That was, and King Ahab that are hunting him down. And so God is asking him to go from this safe place to one of the most dangerous places he could possibly go. But he did because he had trusted God in the past and he'd seen God work and he knew he could trust God now. 
David. Maybe if I say David and speak about David here in the Bible, one of the things that we might think of is David and Goliath. Wow, what a great thing that God had allowed happen. This young man that was able to defeat this giant of a man chop off his head, and change the whole battle that was going on. We had the Israelites and the Philistines, and they were ready to wage war, but he, was, he went out there and he fought Goliath. But where was David before that? Before he fought Goliath, he was standing there watching sheep. Has anybody here ever watched sheep before? If you live, if you live in New Zealand, there are sheep everywhere. And so you get an opportunity to see sheep all the time. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm going to spare you the time of going out and watching the sheep. Sheep are boring. They are boring. They do nothing. They just sit there. They eat. They sleep. They go to the bathroom. And that's about it. And this is what David's dealing with. Sheep. And one day the Bible says, a lion comes. And maybe many of us that were at age 14, 15, 16 year old, when a lion comes... What would, me, what would we might have done? We might have been like, yeah, I'm just going to be over here behind this rock. You just have a pick of any, any of those sheep you want. I, let me know when you're done. I'll just be over here. And we might, that might be how we, how we were. But David goes, no, no, no. This is my responsibility. This is where God's placed me. And even though this is the lowest job in Israel, this is where God's placed me. So I'm going to do something about it. And so the Bible says he runs after the lion. He grabs it by the beard and shoves the sword into it and kills it. And then we see a little while later, a bear comes and David defeats the bear. And he trusted God to help him defeat the lion. And he trusted God to help him defeat the bear. And now he's walking up, bringing the food to the, to the armies of Israel. And he comes upon this scene that we've already said. The Israelites are on one side, the Philistines are on the other. And he, he sees this giant named Goliath standing there mocking blaspheming the armies of Israel, blaspheming God himself. And David comes up. He's like, is there not a cause? Do you not think there is a reason, a purpose, that somebody should go out there and, and challenge this man? He is blaspheming God. Somebody needs to do something. And his brother's like, you're only here because you want to see battle. Get home. What are you doing here? He said, you know what? If nobody's going to do it, I'm going to do it. And then Saul asked him, what are, you, what are you doing? You can't do this. He goes, God's helped me with a lion. God helped me with a bear. God's going to deliver this giant into my hands. And we see David. God used David to, to defeat Goliath, chop off his heads, and, ch and the Israelites chased after the, the retreating Philistine army. But I want to tell you this. I strongly believe that David never, ever, ever would have been able to stand up against Goliath if he didn't trust God with the lion and the bear. Because when he trusted God with the lion and the bear, he was able to stand there and said, God delivered a lion and bear in my hands. God's going to deliver this giant because there's a reason, there's a purpose for this. And God used those smaller problems that seemed, it, when, when, when it came to him, they were huge problems. But in hindsight, they were nothing compared to Goliath. And each and every one of you in this room, every day you have problems. You have temptations. You have themes that, things that seem so big. But in hindsight, compared to something else, they're small. And if you have never trusted, learned to trust God in every area of your life, when it comes to this giant of a problem, maybe God takes your baby, or God takes your spouse with cancer, or a loved one, a friend dies in a car accident. Whatever it may be, if you've never trusted God in the small areas of your life, when this giant of a problem comes, you're going to say, God, I hate you. And you're going to stop reading your Bible. You're going to stop praying. You're going to stop going to church because you can't trust a God that would do that to you. Because you've never learned to trust him by faith, to live by faith, and to learn that he's not doing that to hurt you. He's doing that to grow you, 
to prepare you. He brought the lion and the bear to prepare David for that battle against Goliath. He's bringing these problems into your life, these trials, these tribulations into your life to prepare you for your Goliath. Have you been trusting God? What is your priority when it comes to obeying God? Have you been living your life on results? Or have you been living your life by faith? Because if you don't live by faith and you do it purely by results, you're only going to make it so far. And then you're going to quit. You're going to give up on God because you're not going to see what you expect to see.